important session now and it is the seventh plenary session on polio eradication town hall i would request the facilitator pass the governor sajid parvez bhatti from district 3 to 71 to introduce our moderator thank you very much uh, rashif a very good eve, uh, good morning to all uh, now the time is for the session of a very important session the polio eradication town hall impact tour which is going to be moderated by our none other than else our very dear ri president jennifer jones and our panelists are trustee aziz meman trustee aziz meman is a member of international polio plus committee he is the chair of national polio plus committee in pakistan member arch club society chairman circle he is the president international council of english speaking union he has recipient of pakistan uh, president of pakistan pride of performance award recognition by us congress honorable daniel he got the highest award of rutri international service above self award international service award for polio free world regional service award for polio free world rotary foundation citation for meritorious meritorious services is married to professor sabina aziz no the second panelist is our dr shahzad beg who is a national coordinator for national emergency operation center at pakistan dr shahzad is serving as national coordinator since 20 uh, march 2021 he has a vast global experience working for different programs with a specialty in polio eradication during his time in nigeria he has worked as a technical advisor at the national eoc supporting the operations and strategy group and as deputy incident manager for polio at eoc kano he also served as a member of afro rapid response team supporting syria loan in obr preparedness and nopv approval he is graduated from king edward medical college lahore and post graduate diploma in auto laryn geology and post graduation in public health from university of south wales sydney australia i would request to rotary international president jennifer jones please bring our panelist on the stage Good morning, everyone. I am going to call our panelists up in just a few moments, but first, that was like a little commercial announcement, wasn't it? But first, I want to start with a little bit of um, a level set. In August, the very first leg of the impact tour was to Pakistan, and Director Faze and Trustee Aziz were so completely amazing in putting forward a program over 11 days where Nick and I had the ability to be able to see our program firsthand and to see the depth and breadth and scope of what it is that we're doing in that country. We know that Pakistan is one of our last two endemic countries. And we also know that we've been at this for a long time. And Rotarians everywhere feel the, the sense of fatigue, a sense of pride, but a sense of curiosity about when and how are we going to cross the finish line that we've been talking about for a long time. My friends, while we were there, we were able to see in person how this is going to happen. And that's the discussion that we're going to have today to provide hope to all of us to each of us who spend so much time thinking about how we're going to do this and how we can continue to elevate others to support this, our own Rotary family, our governments, all of the advocacy that we do. The reason that I wanted to go there, and it was the first stop in the impact tour, 
was to be able to meet with the frontline female health workers for one very specific reason, to offer two words, thank you. To be able to sit face to face with these women who every day put their lives on the line, going door to door, meeting mother to mother, mom to mom, building trust. They're the ones, along with our male colleagues as well, but these women are special. They're very special. They call themselves warriors, and they've been warriors in this campaign for multiple decades. They walk tall, they walk proud, they walk in groups of two and three. I had the chance to go walking with them, to knock on some of these doors, to find some of these children. We had the luxury of having a camera crew along to document what we were doing so we could help to share and show this to our Rotary family. We had a lot of security. They blocked off streets. And I went walking with these women. We went to the first door, and there was a woman who opened it. You could tell by looking at her face, the lines on her face. You could read the chapters of her life. She was a beautiful woman. She looked a little older, but I think she probably was younger than me. She introduced me to her grandchildren, four of them. She grabbed my hands as soon as I walked in the door. Now, we didn't speak the same language, but we were able to communicate. She grabbed my hands and she offered me a cup of tea. I will tell you that the room that we walked into did not have a roof. I don't even know what the floor was made of. There was a little bit of a couch off to the front area, uh, a bicycle off to the side, and abject poverty is the only way that I can describe it. Her grandchildren, and we all gathered around, beautiful little children, I have never seen more flies on one little boy than I did that day. Hundreds and hundreds of flies. And all he wanted to do was snuggle up next to me. I just kept swatting flies off. He had an open sore on his leg. There was probably 50 flies that were on his little leg. I watched, as I said, she offered me tea, and I knew that I wasn't going to have tea with her. A, we didn't have the time, and B, I knew that I wasn't going to drink the tea. She had nothing, but she was offering me everything. It was a beautiful moment, to be honest, woman to woman when we looked in each other's eyes as the children were receiving those drops. As we left, she once again grabbed my hands and offered me tea. I wasn't going to be able to share tea with her that day. But I gave her a hug, and we left looking again in each other's eyes. And while her little grandson certainly was going to have likely some health issues, he wasn't going to have polio. That was not going to be his future. He was going to be able to run and walk and play because he wasn't ever going to have this dreaded disease. You're here because you believe in this mission. We all believe that we have the ability to eradicate polio, and we will. We just watched the one. I now want to bring up the two. Dr. Shazad, if you could please come forward, and Aziz, please join me on stage. Thank you. Please, if you'd have a seat here. I'll sit in the middle. Yes. Please. 
The nature of our conversation today is going to be like you're watching a living room discussion. I want you to feel an intimacy to the nature of the way that we're going to be able to talk with each other about getting across the finish line, the challenges that we face, and an insider view to what it's like uh, for those of you who have not had the chance to perhaps visit Pakistan um, or to be as intimately acquainted with what it is that uh, it takes to eradicate a disease. While we were in Pakistan, we had the incredible opportunity to meet Dr. Shahzad. As you know, he is the national coordinator of the Pakistan Polio Plus program, um, extensive work in Nigeria and beyond. Um, but when I walked through the door of the National Emergency Operations Center, as we will refer to it as the NEOC, I made a friend. And there was an automatic warmth that I felt to you, sir. Um, and I think it was just an instant connection that we had. And over the next couple of days in being able to meet and talk and um, have briefings, uh, it was an opportunity to really understand the depth of what's going on in that center. If you could paint a picture for me, for our audience, about what goes on every day at the National Emergency Operations Center in Pakistan. It's located in Islamabad. It is a lovely facility. Um, and there's how many people that, w that are working there? And give us a, a, a slice of a day in, in the NEOC. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, it is an honor to share this stage with you. And uh, Aziz Mehman Sabu is the fatherly for our polio program. So, sir, thank you very much. Uh, the uh, National Emergency Center is in Islamabad, but the same setup we have in the provinces also, where the provincial coordinators are uh, uh, coordinating the program at the provincial levels, and then the deputy commissioners at the deputy, at uh, the districts level are coordinating the program at the districts level. So in these emergency centers, uh, the concept is all partners under one roof. So that means instead of the government communicating with WHO through mail, with UNICEF communicating with Rotary through mails and all those things, all partners, their team leads, and the key people of those organizations, they sit and work in that uh, emergency operation center. They don't sit in their WHO offices or UNICEF offices uh, there. So there is a direct, uh, accessibility to the each team leaders, any things we want to discuss, we discuss in five minutes, just cross and go to other people's uh, office. And uh, so it has brought that sense of emergency. You know, it has removed the bureaucracy uh, in, the, in the there. So that swiftness, that decision making, and the other thing is that everybody owned that decision, you know. So every day we meet at 10 o'clock where all the pro program heads, their uh, different uh, pro sub-program heads because we have an operation teams which is led by the WHO. We have communication and social mobilization team which is led by the UNICEF. We have uh, surveillance teams which is led by the WHO. So different centers, data centers, operation centers, so all these teams, we meet at uh, 10 o'clock every, uh, every day. And, and at the same time, such meetings are taking place at the provincial level also. And we review the previous day, what was discussed in the uh, provincial uh, operation centers. And then when we discuss all the issues, make a decisions, we share it with that uh, province. So the government partners, and the provincial governments all under one roof. Then if there is any emergency, any virus isolations, the detections, any issue, any security incident, we immediately get a line with uh, the concerned people. We are reporting regularly to the health minister and then there is a national task force which meets uh, at least four times a year where the prime minister of Pakistan heads that uh, task force where the issues which requires uh, uh, the uh, prime minister attentions are uh, shared with them. 
And so, ma'am, the least thing is that uh, every month we also meet in with the army leaders in the GHQ because the situation is such that at the operational level, we need army and law enforcement agencies support. So this is how we do it. It's incredible to see the intricacy of how this works together. And I love how you've expressed it and explained it. And the picture that you paint of all partners being on one, under one roof, it really is, um, it exemplifies the partnership in such a profound way. Now, you just mentioned the Army generals that have been supporting us. Aziz, when we were there, we had a chance to go and meet with the top generals of the Army. Um, you had instigated and uh, opened the door for that to be able to happen. While we were there, and we can talk about this now because it's, it's, it's since passed, they gave us a, 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 a briefing, a confidential briefing of the number of uh, soldiers that they were putting into the field to support us in a couple of weeks' time uh, to support the, uh, the national immunization days. But they were going in in a very sort of covert way to kind of, um, in advance of our national immunization days, do some, do some work there. They didn't get a chance to do that in earnest because the flooding happened. Tell us a little bit about the working with the, the National Army generals and what it means to our effort to have the kind of security that they provide in the field for us and how they've now doubled down their efforts. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, President. Uh, uh, thank you, President. Um, yes, we had a good session. Um, I recall with uh, General Azhar Abar, who was the number two. Uh, Director Faiz also was with us. And uh, General Azhar Abbas told you that we have deployed 62,000 army personnel dedicated just for polio. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, two days back, when we were again at the GHQ uh, with the POB chair, Chris Elias, and the directors, uh, we were told that because of the bad security happenings and incidents in southern KP and North Waziristan, that number has been increased to 80,000. So 80,000. You know, and uh, I would like to acknowledge here and thank uh, past president, yeah, Rabindran. He flew into Islamabad at that time along with the president elect Holger, <coughs> and we visited and met General Bajwa. And that time, the then president, uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan. So, you know, without the support of the army, the mission to get over polio is not possible. We need them, we need them, we need them. Uh, you know, now at, thought, uh, at times we tell them that, you know, just take over this area, do it. They said, no, whatever we are doing is the best. Don't put our name there. We are doing everything, everything possible for you. So let you be in the front. Uh, the security and the killing incidents. And one more thing, you know, when uh, my friend Shahzad Peg was mentioning about the NUC, we have the presence there in the NUC of one brigadier. He is the representative of the Pakistan army. So, you know, and then we have the general who the chief of the engineering to coordinate day-to-day -day affairs. You recall when we were mentioning about some uh, incidents, they already were aware of that. So we hope that uh, the, the support continues now. When the SNID started on the first day, there was a blast in Quetta killing four people. And this, this was on a truck carrying the, those uh, forces people to guard the polio vaccinators. This is sad. But you know, 
here, as far as the media is concerned, some do report that this was a backlash against the <clears throat> army or something like that. But then, you know, there are other questions which open up that what is Balochistan Liberation Front and why resistance against the army and all that. So instead of getting into discussion, they find it very convenient to put it on the account of polio, that their mission was to guard the polio workers and they were killed. So, see, whatever be the uh, news reporting, for us it's a sad thing that these people who are doing a noble task to protect the vaccinators, who themselves are doing a noble task, and they are being killed. And it just just not the army. It is the police vaccinated also. They find it you know, easy to target because you know the they know the timings. They know the date. They know that where it is going to happen. So what what else they want? So So the area that you were just speaking about, Aziz, the, um, the bomb blast was about five days ago. And as you heard, four people were, were killed in, in that blast. The areas that, um, or the area that we're looking at right now, I want our, our friends here to have an understanding, Dr. Shazad, about the scope of what we're talking about, because it's come down to a very finite space. The bomb blast that happened um, is in a border region uh, within shouting distance of Afghanistan and Iran. But the KPK is the area that we're really honing in on. And when you start to think about um, how close we are, it's a small space that we're talking about, isn't it? Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, uh, you know, as as much as we are trying to kill the virus, the virus is also trying to save itself, survive, and uh, because it is the most intelligent virus we ever uh, encountered. So now the, where the virus is hiding is a place which is bordering Afghanistan. It has mountains. It has accessibility issues. It has a community which is uh, which has mistrust which has apprehensions, which is not sure about the safety of the vaccine, which are not happy with the government. And then in that area, there is highly mobile population, which is moving from Afghanistan to that side of the border. And then within that area, we call it South KP, the six districts. Uh, and for the last 18 to 20 months, this is the only area in Pakistan where the virus is surviving. The other rest of the Pakistan, which is almost 95% of the Pakistan, it has not reported any case for the last almost two years, uh, 19 months to be specific when it was the last case out of uh, that uh, area. So the, that is an area where it is. And then on top of all these things is the security situation. The security situation is worsening. And when we say security situation, we need to break it down to understand. The security situation, one is how difficult it is for the teams to reach that area. But even if they reach in that area, how fearful they are in that area, how much they feel secure. Either they are working in a relaxed manner, spending time in the house, talking to the families the way you are, accept teas or refuse, you know, or they are in a rush to uh, move from that area. And then once they finish, are they able to do a catch up or not to, for those children which were out of. So all these things are the most difficult when it comes to my operations, and these are the things which are ideal for the virus to survive there. So that is the final frontier where we are having that problem. Well, and for some of those workers who um, are reporting in, um, we know that some of them will go buy a house 
but say that it's been visited. I mean, some of some of the challenges we have are are really human challenges of people who have fear, um, who are looking at trying to actually get do their job every single day um, against incredible obstacles. Now, when we talk about bringing it down to a very finite area, and I mentioned that this is like being in your living room having a discussion, normally you get a little bit of a behind the scenes look at things when you're talking in your living room with people. And we have a surprise for you today because one of the things that I was blown away by in visiting the NEOC was some new technology that has been embraced for the better part of a year and I had the opportunity to have a briefing on this technology when I was there. And when I sat down to the, the briefing with all of the, uh, the partners, and I, I said, this absolutely blew my mind. And Bill Gates had been there just a couple of months earlier, and he went on to a national meeting to say, what I've just seen blows my mind. So today, you're going to get a glimpse into what this looks like because it's super duper cool. Um, that's not a technical term. Um, but Dr. Shazad, can you give us a little bit of a slide presentation about what this looks like? Because my friends, this is what's going to get us across the finish line. So if you would, let's bring up the slides and, and perhaps do you want to do it from here or from the podium? Well, I'll do it from here, okay. but uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, just a little background. When we are doing the campaigns, we are, one, we want to ensure that the teams goes there. Then the second component is that teams go inside the house and then whatever happens inside the house is between that vaccinator and the God. And then when they come out, they tell, I have vaccinated uh, this uh, child. So we wanted to make sure, number one, that the teams are going there and whether which are the areas where they are not going, is there any scientific proof? Uh, so that is uh, what we will, I would like. Thank you very much. Absolutely. So as you get ready to hear this, it's pretty cool. Thank you very much. So. So I would like to, um, is it working? So I would like to share with uh, with you an innovative technology which we call GCSS, Geographical Coverage Support Systems, and uh, we use the smartphones to identify the missed areas where whether the teams have gone or not. Next slide, please. So. You know, usually the polio campaigns, they use the paper-based uh, microplans, and these microplans cannot identify that if a settlement is uh, covered or not. It only tells us that these are the areas where the teams will go, and what are the children uh, uh, they have vaccinated based on uh, their information, which is, as I said, which happen inside the house, and that is between them and the God. So what we have done is and implemented an innovative technology solution where, number one, we digitize and then track. We digitize the area, the boundaries, and then we give the trackers to the team so that we can uh, track uh, uh, their movement. Next slide, please. So how do we do it? You know, we don't have any digital maps available in Pakistan, so we have to do it manual, manually. So first of the things which we do there is to uh, digitize. What we, what we mean by that is that the minimum scale is the union council level where the vaccinator on the motorbike area in charge on the motorbike goes with the, with the trackers and they tell uh, what is their boundaries. So when all the area in charges has done their boundaries, after that we are in a position to see when we put that in a map, what are the areas which this area in charge was thinking that it is in the other uh, person's boundaries and he is thinking. So what are the areas which everybody is missing, thinking that it will be covered by the uh, those areas. Then, after we have done those uh, boundaries, we, 
we go into the Google map and then see that those areas, what is beneath those areas? Is there a playground, a football field, or are the so we divide those areas into areas of interest where there is a population, where could be the children, and the areas of no interest. So we remove the areas of no interest, and then we go back to the drawing board on the micro plans, and then we sit with those area in charges and tell them that this is an area of interest. It is in nobody's micro plan. So who is going to take it? So this, so this is how we uh, do this digitization process. Next. So, during the digitization of activities, we, as I told you, we identified the areas and any unclaimed area. Next slide, please. So, how the GCS works? What we do is that we, we give the smartphones. We give the smartphones, which are $40 uh, mobile phones to the teams. We give it to them. They are already charged. They have the two SIMs inside them so that uh, any network which is in that area, they will have. And they save the tracks. So the teams don't have to do anything. They just receive it, put it in their bag, and then they are going into that area. And they are uh, doing their vaccination process as they are doing somewhere else. And that's also um, a security point as well, that they actually have this cell phone on them. We know where they're at and, and where their activity is. Yes, uh, I will in the subsequent time. We know from where they left, uh, how much they travel, where they spend the times. So all those uh, areas uh, from the security point also and their movements also. Next slide, please. So it is a simple solution, you know, it is a simple device, it is easy to carry, there is no additional task by the teams, and you know, it does not interrupt their operations, and uh, this device could be monitored. Uh, that means, you know, uh, in those areas, because of their safety also, we know where, uh, where it is. And it has a high location precision, up to six meters, six to 10 meters, uh, and it tells us uh, how it is uh, going. And uh, uh, then we, once we have that tracks in the evening, the people, they come back, we download those tracks and then uh, take actions. Next slide, please. So this is how it looks like an interactive uh, uh, dashboard. This dashboard is available during uh, real time, you know. So it has three components during the campaigns. It tells us deployment of the teams. Like if the, the data is showing that the teams left at seven o'clock, but we will know uh, exactly whether the team reached in the team sports center at eight o'clock or nine o'clock or what time they said. It will also tell us how much time they spent in the field. It will also tell us whether they were a motorbike, where they were walking, how much time they were spending inside the household because every 60 seconds they is telling locations and the time, the speeds, everything uh, it tells us. So if they are in an area and they cover that area quickly, they have not spent less than three minutes in every house. We assume that they are in that area, but they are not going inside the houses. So that is during the campaigns. Then the post campaigns, uh, we see after the tracks, which are the missed areas. And then by after the Google map, verifying if it is an area of interest, then we ask the teams to go back into those areas and uh, do the vaccination campaign. And the post campaign, uh, we compare it, the same areas with the previous campaigns. How was those uh, areas? Uh, uh, between the campaign, different campaigns, whether our coverage has improved. If we were missing that area in one campaign, if we are doing good, then because of the better macro planning and validations, that area should not be missed in the uh, subsequent round. So that, are the, so that dashboard is telling us uh, these three during the campaign, post campaign, and uh, then the comparison of the campaign. Next slide, please. 
So these are the tracks of the themes. We can see day one, day two, day three tracks, and it tells us it is the day two track. So this is a live tracks which we watch whether they are uh, going into those areas or not, and uh, with uh, how much times they are spending. Uh, we know you can see those areas. Uh, these are the teams sports center in the last. That is from where they started their journey, and then these are the houses where they are going. This is the team sports center. Uh, so uh, this is uh, how we watch their tracks live uh, on our mobile phones. Next slide, please. So just like Uber, this is a live animation which we have the, on our mobile. You know, uh, if we are in an area. Uh, a supervisor, he can see on his mobile what are the teams. This is the supervisor. If you look, if you look at the third uh, mobile, you know that blue spot is where the supervisor is, and this uh, purple one is telling the teams which are working uh, in those areas. So it is easy for uh, the supervisor to see uh, which are the teams nearby in those areas and how they are working. So you can choose any portions, any you see anywhere you want to check, and that will show you of that area, how that area is being covered, how many teams they are working, whether they are in the area or not. And then you can just go there and uh, check that. Next slide, please. So this is a comparison in the Bano City. That is uh, the February round, and this is the next round. As I was saying that we do the comparison. So when we did this uh, campaign in Banu in February, these red areas are the areas which were uh, missed by the teams. So it was validated that they were areas of interest. The teams were asked to go back where the teams were not. Those areas were not in their micro plan. It was put in their micro plan. And see in the next rounds when uh, the campaign uh, after that we checked, the majority of the 95% of the areas they have covered. So it really helped in improving the quality of the campaign. Here I just want to emphasize that we don't keep on doing in the same area again and again. We do three rounds. We identify the gaps. We cover them, improve our micro plans based on that micro plan. We do that campaign analysis of the different rounds. And if we see that the situation has improved and now the coverage has gone to 95%, are above that, then we take that process to another area, wherever we have uh, uh, our doubts. Next slide, please. So this is another example that uh, our, uh, after the campaign analysis, post campaign analysis showed us that that is an area in the slide lamp one uh, that has not been uh, covered. Then we go into the Google map, it shows that there is some structures there. And then if we go and see the third slide, it is a mud house, partially built, but the family was living there and the children were there. And the teams, difficult areas we can see, but we were still able to identify the area. And this is a picture taken by the team after uh, reaching there. So we tell them, and when they are going back to cover that area, we have their geo coordinates. So we are still tracking them and seeing them whether they have actually gone into that areas or not in. Next slide, please. So uh, this is how this program uh, is uh, helping us in improving the efficacy, performance, and seeing and telling us uh, it, this program, this cannot tell us whether they are putting the two jobs in the mouth of the children, but it can at least tell us whether they are going there, how much time they are spending there, or if they are not going there. And then we have a system in place where we ensure that they are going there and they are vaccinated, you know. Now, this is not only we are doing in the, uh, during the Kampata campaign. We have uh, NOMAD uh, vaccination strategy where we have uh, teams on motorbikes and they pick vaccine in the morning and then they are just uh, traveling or driving on the nomads routes and wherever they identify the nomad settlements uh, are and their camps, they go there. 
and vaccinate them. So they are also being tracked so that we know on a daily basis. Similarly, their supervisors, uh, when they are going, we are also giving the tracker to them so that it is tracking of the supervisors also, whether they are actually in the field or they are just sitting in the hotel and sending us the... Um, so there are different applications of this technology which we are uh, bringing. We are even considering giving it to the, when we are doing our intensified outreaches to make sure that uh, we are. Next slide, please. Next slide. So uh, we have, as uh, Jennifer said, we have completed one year. And in this one year, we have done 11 campaigns. In 59 districts, we have checked by this methodology. We have tra tracked almost 10,000 stream. Uh, and uh, in this campaign, we are tracking 3,400. And we are making plans for the next years where we want to uh, do. Some areas, we only want to do digitization so that we improve the quality of the campaign. Some areas we are doing the tracking also, especially our high risk areas we are doing. Next slide, please. So, uh, this is uh, when uh, Mr. Bill Gates uh, visited uh, our uh, National Emergency Operations Center and uh, he, he just praised uh, our program. The, the, the statement, you know, the energy uses state of the art information tools developed by GPI to track polio so that no child is ever paralyzed by it again. The NCCO has applied resources and lessons learned from the polio program, including data analysis, vaccine campaign planning. So, so both centers blew me away, you know. He was, re and he has uh, commented on uh, this a couple of times afterward also. So coming this uh, from a tech uh, genius is really a, a, an honor for us. And uh, we, he, he sent us the letter of appreciation also on that. Next slide, please. And then uh, we all see our own Jennifer Jones also visited. Uh, we gave the same presentation to her also, how it works and all those things. And uh, I leave it to her to uh, give comments on that, how she felt about it. I think this is my last slide. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that with us. And it really was, it, it blew me away as, equally as well. The ability to be able to go, particularly using this technology, to a community, to an area, to a street, to a house, to a child, it, it really does get into the infinitesimal nature of who the last ones are that we're trying to find. Aziz, this is a very small area. How many, how many miles are we talking about um, in terms of where the last cases exist? Uh, thank you, President. Actually, you know, we are, uh, when we, across Pakistan, we have millions of children under five. Now, in that area of southern KP, North Waziristan, which is Lucky, Marwad, Banu, they are a handful of 43,000 children. Doing them, taking care of them is not an issue. If there is no fear in the mind of vaccinators, because these uh, elements who want to disturb it, they make sure that on the first day of the campaign, some WHO worker is kidnapped or someone, something or the other, they want to create an incident just to create fear. Now, you know what? The good part is that the virus is contained there. It did spill over, not in terms of getting cases, wild cases, but in terms of getting positive environment samples in 16 districts which are now negative. So if you look at the map of Pakistan, it is now showing green. So this is a very positive sign. And we are moving with our mission of GPI, with the support of the partners, and targeting to stop transmission 
in 2023 in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Afghanistan definitely has issues because the eastern province and Nagarhar and all this home to home vaccination is still an issue. Last night I mentioned to you that 21st of January uh, a visit is being uh, you know tried for the deputy prime minister of Afghanistan to come to Doha once the uh, the World Cup is over and hopefully uh, Chris Elias your friend and Mike McGovern will be also there so um, issues are there main issue is the security that creates the gaps, but the partners, NEOC, and they are fully committed to make sure that we stop transmission in 2023 so that we can complete the total work by 2026. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aziz. So we're getting close to wrapping up here, but there's a few last things that I think are important for us to know. We've honed in on the area that uh, we know is sort of the last stronghold that we need to, to get across, but it's a very transitory um, area and, the, and the, um, the, the, the traffic between Afghanistan, Pakistan, there's a lot of coming and going and being able to monitor that is incredibly important. There's been some strides made in how we're identifying people and how we're dealing with people as they go through different transit points. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what we're doing to help in that regard? Okay, so first uh, just uh, adding to Aziz Saab if you allow me. Uh, the, the area the, where the virus is, the North Waziristan, where we had 20 out of, 17 out of the 20 cases, that area is about 15 kilometers. Those 17 cases are in that area, you know. And that is an area where if you go to those people and tell that virus is in your area, they still say it's a lie. It's an American conspiracy because by proving that virus is there, they want to bring their agents and drones again. You know, so the, and then the two are the surrounding districts to those where the virus has uh, uh, spilled over. So the area is not big, the, uh, you know, and uh, now when it comes to the population movement, yes, we, you know, there is a authorized population movement and then the, the Afghans always find a way to, you know, move despite the fencing. It has just made a big significant improvement, but still there are some unauthorized, unauthorized area. So as far as the authorized areas are, we have compulsory 24-7 the uh, vaccination point, cross-border vaccination points. The Rotary has provided us, uh, you know, with the facilities, the containers and all those things. And there we are doing all age vaccinations of everybody who is coming from the other side of the border to the, this side of the border. And then we have put in place a mechanism where we then follow them where they have settled so that we can follow them for the uh, subsequent uh, doses. We have also made this uh, ring fencing around South KP, where all the exit point for points from the South KP, we have uh, temporary transit points where the vaccination teams are there which are vaccinating children less than five years every time they are going out of that area. So we are doing, but uh, if it uh, foolproof, no. Uh, we still have challenges in, uh, you know, ensuring that everybody gets vaccinated. But all we can do is uh, we are uh, trying. The other thing uh, which I want to bring into the notice is that, honestly speaking, we have the commitment both political as well as the technical from the teams. We have the people, the technical teams to capacity. We have the support from all partners. I started with my thanks with the Rotary, uh, Aziz Saab, just a call away, you know, just a call and I know it will be done. And same is for the other partners. WHO, UNICEF, 
they are always, they are part of my team. You know, when I say EOC, that means me, WHO, and UNICEF. And then the ABLE is supported by CDC, WHO, uh, Rotary, and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So all the ingredients, all the ingredients which are required to finish this task, to complete the Rotary dream, are there. The challenge is only uh, that there is a Masood belt where I have not done campaign in the last five months. There are 28,000 children unvaccinated there for the last five months because of the security challenges, I cannot reach there. Then there are two, three pockets where because of the security reasons, I am asked to finish campaign in one day. You know, so whatever I can do, I have to do it in one day. So is it my, it more than 85% quality campaign, can I do it in one day? No, because I'm not doing any revisits and all those things. So these are my weak points, my soft bellies, where if I fail, you know, these are the areas where the virus has the capacity and the ingredients to survive. But we are making sure, program is so robust that there were 13 areas, the different districts, <coughs> excuse me, where the virus spill over in the environment, all of them became negative. You know, so we have that. Thank you. You just, just one, 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 one second, Aziz, I'm going to come to you next. You just said, if I fail. This is very personal for you, isn't it? Yeah. Aziz, you have a point you wanted to make. Yeah. Uh, just one thing I wanted to add, because you have been in the Karachi EOC also, you remember. Karachi, Lahore, Quetta, EOC, if you go there and you ask them, that show us the mapping of the movement of the population from southern KP that where they are and where, how they are being tracked. So, you know, those people who are moving up and down from southern KP or coming and living there are very well tracked so, so that they are, con they are contained. Thank you. This was just my, I wanted to add. Thank you. No, thank you, Aziz. We are, uh, we're going to conclude now, and um, I want to take the opportunity. It's always good when it comes from outside of your own home. When we were sitting at the table at the NEOC, and quite candidly, anywhere that we traveled within Pakistan, whenever um, someone was referencing Rotary, they had something to say with, um, with regard to our, our friend Aziz, who was sitting to my to my left. Tell me, tell me what, um, what you think of, of what he's provided to us in our capacity, because I know that it's uh, like, a, like a great uncle in many ways. No, I will say fatherly. Uh, I tell him all the time. The thing is that uh, the first thing which uh, the Rotary and Aziz are bring on the table is accessibility. You know, I, I discuss my personal problems, guidance, you know, what are my challenges going there. You know, even yesterday he gave me a lecture for 30 minutes. So, you, know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, at least it was uh, with the cappuccino, but uh, you know, he was, uh, but that is the, that is uh, my relation. And the other thing is, it's not only Aziz Saab, the Rotary Pakistan, Kadwai Saab, the district governors, I tell them that, you know, I need somebody in the national EOC, the provincial EOC. He sends the representations. When you are there, we ask for, you know, that uh, umbrellas and all those yeah. things. And he immediately called you. I could have done anywhere, you know, any anyhow and all those things. So his accessibility, his uh, openness, and his willingness to do all this. So many times I send a very short notice. I need uh, that permanent transit points in that area. We are shifting the location. You have to provide new containers and all the setup. And then, you know, he, he still does that. So uh, for me, it's a rotary dream. You know, I am, I am trying to finish uh, what you started, what you believed in. 
you know. And uh, I believe that uh, maybe the God prepared me for that, you know. So as far as the commitment, the, the thing which I bring to this program is candidness and honesty. If there will be anything not working, I will not give a good report. You know, if not working, I will tell, you know. So that is my commitment to Aziz Saab, to Rotary, and to everybody. But honestly speaking, if you ask me, what you believe, I believe that this is our best opportunity. We had opportunities before also, but when those opportunities came, were we ready technically, administratively, operationally to grab that opportunity? Maybe not. You know. But this time, uh, we are ready and we have that capacity also. Just give me the access. Let me reach those areas and uh, for that also, uh, I give you an example. Two days ago, the three districts, the Dera Ismail Khan, South Waziristan, and Tang, they called us that we cannot do campaign till end of February. In the same meeting, we told them this is not acceptable. The same day, we went to the Prime Minister, uh, Aziz Saab, and uh, Chris Elias presented. The same day, he asked the Minister to go to the immediately to Peshawar, and the next day, the same districts have reported that, yes, we are starting the campaign. You know, so that is the level we are doing. Thank you. You just mentioned something um, in your earlier comment, just uh, as you started, about the umbrellas. Can I tell this story? Okay. So when I arrived, we walked into the center, and probably about five minutes in, um, you walked over and you handed me just kind of quietly a piece of paper. And on that piece of paper was data points and a request for umbrellas and flasks, water flasks, for the female health workers in the field. Uh, they're out there in sometimes 100 plus degree heat. Um, the sun is beating down. I walked for two hours and got to get into a air conditioned car and leave. They continued on for many, many hours, and I can tell you, it was not, it was not easy at all. And so there was a very um, sort of quiet request, is there something you could do about this? So then we sat down at the meeting, the briefing. I'll be really candid, it's a table of probably about 40 people of men, and sitting around the outer perimeter is primarily women, and I asked the question, what can we do to get these umbrellas and water flasks into the hands of these frontline health workers? And there was a lot of, oh, well, you're the can down the road kind of, kind of thing. I came to find out that we've been trying to do this for some time, unsuccessfully, we don't have the budget for it. And so I said, well, can we find out the budget for it? Because for God's sakes, these women need this, this is something, a tool that they need to get this done. And I asked them what they need, and they said, this is what they need and more security, which we got. I said, please tell me how much this is because we'll f it's not in the budget. We'll find the money. We'll find a private donor. We'll ask somebody for money. Well, Aziz in seconds was on the phone figuring out this, figuring out that. Um, recently talking with our good friends at WHO, um, Aiden O'Leary there. Uh, anyway, it's happening. We found the money. The women are getting the umbrellas and the flasks. It's good. No short order because he was able to get on it quickly and find it. Um, but thank you for identifying something that needed to be championed. And um, that was a diversity, equity, and inclusion moment in real time. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, whatever the success we are achieving, we are achieving because of those frontline workers, you know. And we are not giving them uh, enough money. Even this budget which we are making, my first demand, while there is a pressure from the GPI to reduce the budget, but still I am reducing on everything, but at I am increasing their logistic supports. So, uh, because for the success of this program, the commitment and hard work of those frontline workers and the necessary support is required. I want to finish on the note that in this polio program, 
we our my frontline worker both the workers female worker as well as the policemen uh, we are still counting but the count at, as i speak now is 69 the 69 frontline workers and police personnel have lost their lives you know uh, while working for this polio program so we 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 owe to those martyrs also and our best uh, gift to them could be only the sattva i think that is a perfect note for us to wrap up on and as we walk through the halls of the neoc those martyrs are shown on the walls their photos hang there so that everyone has an opportunity when they walk by them every day to see the people who have actually put their lives um who have lost their lives uh, because of the work that they're doing but i want to thank you both for the incredibly um huge lift that you do for being here with us and traveling here to be able to share uh what it is is that you're doing please take back to all of your colleagues at the NEOC and beyond our profound thanks for what it is that you do for bringing to life and um putting it into the field our dreams we raise money we advocate many of us go into the field to immunize but you're doing you're doing the hard work so to both of you thank you for the lifetime of work that you've done to make this happen and thank you for sharing this with us today now request uh, pass district governor and he is also the chair for national polio plus committee Pan chief coordinator for punjab pass district governor mohammad sai shamsi thank you for giving me this opportunity actually the gratitude at such occasions is for the speakers but my highest gratitude and thanks to you being there in pakistan for this polio plus program because you know I have been associated with this program since 92 93 we get hopes of being very close we are that close we are that close and then we are that close so what happens is that a case here a case there and some problems occur you're going there because the rotarians of district our district were getting frustrated because they are putting in day in and day out their effort following the nids snids aziz always pushing them go follow the workers go for people who are refusing to get drops our rotarians go personally to the houses convince the lady of the house please open the door for the vaccinator please open the door for the vaccinator unfortunately when they see a vaccinator coming they all close the door they hide the children that is the most unfortunate part of it but your coming over there has made a lot of difference and with uh shahzad beg being there as coordinator chief national oc coordinator and another thing he is a member of our club rotary club probably you don't know that <laughs> he didn't tell you that <laughs> yeah so he has put in this new technology what we were missing was that we do a pre survey which we call a detailed analysis micro planning in which we see that this house has got two children under 5 years this house has got one children child under 5 years but the nomadic movements they were not available to us and they would move from one place to the other so the number of uh, vax children to be vaccinated were not true so now thank you very much aziz mehman is always there i, I don't have to thank him he is uh, and i are hand in hand together he was a governor a year before me i took over from him and i continue following his right thank you very much for being there and enlightening us i would request sare director and convener to please join on the stage we had zero cases last year and we're going to make sure this happens again this year
Thank you. Please kindly take your seat. Thank you.